This special edition of the Multipoint Inspection Podcast is possible thanks to a proud partnership with Dealer Marketing Magazine. From the people who help you know your competition, IntelliCheck presents the Multipoint Inspection Podcast. The Multipoint Inspection Podcast brings you news and stories from the automotive world told in an informative and entertaining way. We've been working on AI secretly for a year and a half. And Did you know that when your customer called up, they had to call three times before they were able to speak to anybody? Because you might be throwing money into something that isn't correcting the actual issue. Something that's been a recurring topic and it's coming up more and more to how le- electric vehicles are going to impact the service and parts operations. So, Because as you can imagine, over the years, AI has been developing and we've been looking at how can we get better. You know, that Japanese Kaizen, we're looking at this continuous improvement and we kind of have gotten addicted to saying how could we help advisors dealers and techs toyota ceo koji sato just unveiled the company's new sales strategy that involves selling vehicles directly to consumers starting next year amazon says you will be able to put a new car into your shopping cart it will be selling hyundai cars on its platform and then looking for ways not to just sell them the product but a way to help them because that's what people want too they want to be helped I finally figured out that 98% of customer experience is how well or how poorly you communicate. The automotive industry is in the middle of revolutionary change. And while this was well underway before 2020, the pandemic and its aftermath sent this change into overdrive. Tech shortages, supply chain issues, rising new and used vehicle prices, electric vehicles, and AI are all part of the discussion these days. And with the new year upon us, it is only fitting to have a discussion about what 2024 might hold for dealerships and their fixed ops departments. So it seemed like a perfect time to enlist the help of Dealer Marketing Magazine and some of their experts to try to see what 2024 has in store. Meet the panel. Hi, I'm Lori Halter. I'm with Charisma Communications, a PR firm specialized in the automotive space. We have a large focus on fixed ops, so I'm excited to be here today. It's been great for fixed ops the last few years. I think it's going to get even better as uh, you know inventory flows back onto the lots. I think the big things I'm seeing from a PR perspective is AI continues to be a really big trend and how it's used in the fixed ops department. Training with Quantum 5 on here. I'm so happy Sarah's on today because training will continue to be imperative as we move forward. And then I think things like payments. I'm working with some clients who are looking at creating surcharges that are helping bring in like hundred to 200,000 a month for some of these dealers. So I think just looking at surcharges and other ways that fixed ops departments can not only bring more money in, but save money as they go. Hi, I'm Sarah Vantine. I'm the vice president of solutions with Quantum 5, a full service automotive training technology company. You know, I'm really excited about 2024 because we've seen so much change in the last few years across fixed operation departments. They've had some incredible years, but one of the trends that is going to continue across not only fixed operations in dealership businesses, but businesses everywhere, customers continue to vote for what company that they want to do business with and be loyal to based on their experience that they have. It is time to really embrace upskilling your people with valuable knowledge of how to interact to a variety of customers and be flexible with whatever that customer wants to do in their service process. Uh, The more that dealerships lean into having servicing available in a variety of different ways for their customers, those dealerships are going to really win in their market areas. I'm Tom Klein. I'm a former auto dealer for more than 30 years. When we sold our stores four years ago, I started my consulting business. And what I do is I help dealers tuck the octopus. And what that means is running a dealership is like trying to tuck an octopus into bed and the tentacles keep going all over the place. So from a risk perspective and a client compliance perspective, uh, I help dealers tuck the octopus and keep them safe and warm and cozy and dry. 
So considering all of the compliance and risk matters, I keep reading where batteries keep lighting on fire, not on purpose, obviously. And so I think safety will continue to be an issue in the fixed op end of things. And so making sure you have the proper policies and procedures, I think, on your fixed end department will continue to be important. And I think the regulators will continue to focus on that area going forward. Hello, uh, my name is Owen Moon. I am a co-founder of FixOps Digital. Uh, we were recently acquired by Trade Pending, so I'm also a, a director now at Trade Pending. And uh, really what we do is provide a, uh, a piece of technology that helps dealerships market and merchandise their fixed operations departments on their uh, dealerships' websites. Yeah, you know, in fixed operations in the last couple of years, as Sarah just mentioned, we've had some tremendous revenue uh, years and, and a lot of profits coming out of that side of the business. What we've noticed recently is is the amount of service repairs is actually starting to decrease a little bit, but the profitability is, is still there. As we move into 2024, I call it the year of the teenager. You know, our vehicles are pushing over 13 years on the road. And so it's opening up all kinds of opportunities with other profit centers and things like that. So the dealerships that can really embrace those different profit centers can really take advantage of working on those 13 plus year old vehicles are really going to see the difference between a, a very profitable year and maybe a a semi-profitable year, what they, which is what they're normally used to. So uh, that's kind of my thoughts for 2024. Owen says that with 2024 being the year of the teenager because people are holding on to their vehicles for up to 13 years now, that service department should focus on late ownership services. Owen explains... Yeah, you know, as an industry, I think we've gotten really, really comfortable with uh, working inside the service drives for um, new cars. You know, so what ends up happening there, right? You do a lot of maintenance jobs, you do a lot of maybe small repairs and things like that, but you really don't get into some of those late ownership repairs. They normally come, you know, once warranties up or once that prepaid maintenance is up. And what ends up happening is a lot of times pre, um, you know, sort of market conditions that we're in, a lot of people were on a tr on a trade cycle where before before we got into those late ownership services or had to switch out those tires, brakes, things like that, we were trading that vehicle. So the dealership would absorb that and then obviously put that back on the lot as, as a pre-owned vehicle. I think what we've seen is that late ownership services are becoming much more a part of our daily lives. And so it's, it's a good thing for the dealership because it's a customer pay opportunity. They're higher repairs. So they're, they're higher margins. It makes the dealership more money. But I, I know that some dealerships just haven't really been set up for that, right? They're used to that express type of strategy where we're just running people through the lane and, and changing oil and, and things like that, where you start getting into brakes and you know transmissions and alignment services and tires. There's a little different process to that, right? There's getting those parts in and making sure that the customer is aware of the timelines and things like that. And so training becomes a big part of that. And, and I think that's you know something that dealerships have to embrace as they move into next year. But if they do embrace late ownership services and they really can create good processes around that, um, I think it's a great place for them to, you know, increase their revenue for the future, especially, you know, I don't feel like we're going to be out of this anytime soon where the average vehicle is going to start dropping again. I think that 13 years, I mean, it's been going up steady since 2021. So I feel like it's a great opportunity for those dealerships that are embracing it. So the OEMs are starting to understand that the late service is important. I mean, I think that's part of, as an example, Ford has a new used car program that you can warranty any maker model on a Ford dealer's lot. And so they're trying to get the customers and the dealers all to buy in to make sure that there's something tying that vehicle back to the dealership, which I think is a good thing. I don't know all the ins and outs and would certainly defer to, to Sarah and Owen on all things fixed ops. But from my observations and my work, that's what I'm seeing. There are a lot of moving parts in a dealership. And Sarah Vantine says that training is imperative to get everyone on the same page in order to give a great overall customer experience. Specifically with automotive training and fixed operations department, I'm going to segment it a little bit and talk about some of the BDC pieces and then also the advisor pieces. Because really, when you look at what a service customer experience is, it's offense and defense and special teams. 
when you're talking about that entire cohesive strategy that applies to training at a dealership. What's been happening and what the conversations we've been having a lot recently have been connecting the dots between all of the different silos and departments that the customer encounters during that service experience that they're having. That ultimately drives the retention of that customer to your organization. And that ultimately also builds that relationship for a more long-term sustainable model with keeping that customer invested with your advisors and, and with your rooftop. One of the challenges that has been happening in dealerships that people I think are more aware of today, you know, as, as Owen was describing, there's a lot of vehicles that are getting later stage. There's older vehicles that are coming into service departments. That's something that has always been the case. But one of the breakdowns that happens for a customer is the miscommunication that happens as they're getting ready to book that service appointment. When they go to your website, there's so many different avenues for them to engage in that servicing experience. And what is a real big challenge for a lot of dealerships when they're talking about seeking training, what they're looking for is how do I connect the dots between everything? I can teach a service advisor how to do a great MPI review in the lane, but what happens when that customer drops their vehicle off and they're only available through text message? How do I communicate the needs that are happening and the timeline that's happening? One of the things that we see across BDC departments a lot, there's a high percentage of calls that are coming into some organizations where they're status update inquiries. And so they're not necessarily an appointment setting phone call. It's something that the customer is already captive. They're already in the service department. They're already waiting on their vehicle to be complete. And they're trying to find an answer and they can't get it through all of the different channels that they have available to them to communicate back with their advisor. And so for us, what's important in our approach at Quantum 5 with our training programs is that we have to create a omni-channel holistic approach to how we enable service advisors, BDC, parts departments, whoever it is in that customer experience to all be aware of all of the different processes and pieces that come into play when you're communicating with the customer about servicing their vehicle. And so taking all those threads and weaving them together into one cohesive experience, you have to be mindful of a lot of different facets of training that it requires a lot of different departments, that requires a lot of different people. And each one of those people is probably at a different skill set for being equipped to talk to a customer about you know, tires that are needed on a vehicle. You have an advisor that's been there for 10 years, they're going to have a very different approach than an advisor that just started six weeks ago. How do you bring all of those pieces together so that the customer has a really universal experience on every visit? And really, that's what I'm seeing is the target and the focus that a lot of dealerships are realizing. They haven't had either the training invested in their people in the last few years, or if they have been training and they've been working on it. It's all existed in silos in their approach. And so the BDC is receiving one type of coaching and that may be just appointment driven or you know getting them in the door. And then the service advisor is receiving a totally different kind of training and the threads are not mixing together. First, you know, a service advisor's job is tough because the customer is going to call up and say, I need this repair. And structurally, unless they have access to whether the customer bought a warranty or not, uh, or an extended service contract, they will have a tough time having communication to begin with. The customer is going to say, well, I, I bought my car there. Don't you know whether I have an extended service contract? So if you start off in a very kind of awkward, difficult position, unless there's a, a way that the service advisors have all that information uh, right at their fingertips. Lori Halter says that the business that makes things more convenient for the customer wins. And for some dealerships, this means offering mobile repair or pickup and delivery services. 
think a lot of the fixed ops and dealership managers are looking at how do we make it easier and more convenient? I mean, you've got Amazon is literally testing a program right now where they come to the person's driveway, fix whatever they need in the driveway with mobile mechanics and then leave. And so this is the type of stuff we're up against. One of my clients right now, Traver Connect, has created a mobile pickup and delivery service. And so with this service, dealerships would be able to dispatch someone to go to someone's house pick up the vehicle, bring it back to the dealership. The entire way along the way, there's that mobile communication exactly to what Sarah was speaking about. You know, you're not getting calls anymore to the dealership service drive to say, is my vehicle ready? They can look on their phone and find out if it's ready and track it. Think like the Domino's pizza tracker kind of along those lines. And then it's delivered back to their house, finished at the end of the day. And really what they're finding is dealerships are not only competing against rising interest rates, they're competing against independent shops, right? They're competing against folks that can get your car in and out within half an hour. And so this is one way that some of my clients are finding dealerships are starting to compete is this pickup and delivery service. And it's available today. It's just, it's in its infancy, but it's available now. The logistics are ready. Well, I got, I got a funny story about pickup and delivery and it kind of ties into this all together. So, you know, COVID hits 2020 and all of a sudden, you know, the service departments become essential, right? We had about 500 or so clients at that point, if I remember right. And all of a sudden in like a, about a 10 day period, we had created and deployed about 500, a little over 500 pickup and delivery pages that we put on our dealerships websites along with banners and, and that type of thing. Because ultimately no one really knew what was going on, but we were like, hey, we've got to be able to still make money and still operate. People just aren't going to come to the dealership anymore because they're afraid to leave their house. Well, I would say within a month, 60% of those people are like, take it down, take it down. I don't, we're not ready to, we don't have the infrastructure for this. So it was like, it was like, it was great in theory, but the problem was in the execution. I think that's what both, you know, Lori and Sarah kind of mentioned is that Sarah's talking about, hey, we've been so siloed. How do we execute this that we don't lose that customer experience? And obviously, Lori's working with some companies now that have kind of embraced that and said, hey, we're going to help you, Mr. or Mrs. Dealer, actually execute on that. And wish we'd had that back in 2020 because uh, it would have probably saved a lot of headache on our end. But uh, yeah, great. Funny story about uh, pickup and delivery service. So. I think you're absolutely right too. I, I, it's the logistics part, right? It's like you're saying, we can throw up banners and say, yeah, we've got pickup and delivery now, but it's all of those relationships and partnerships behind the scenes that needs to figure out, okay, but how exactly is this going to work? And how is it going to work in a way that doesn't make the customer upset? You know, we want whatever we're delivering, we want need to make sure that it's actually working and not going to create a worse situation. So I would agree. I want to piggyback off of Laurie and Owen's comment for a second, because talking about the logistics and all of those pieces, you know, tying it back in into training for a second, one of the biggest pieces that often happens when there's stress in an organization, when there's stress in the process, and we are trying something new, it gets abandoned because the leadership in the organization isn't completely bought in to executing it because it's more convenient to go back to processes and things and the way that we've always done it. And so one of the other elements of training that is so important right now is we're looking at, and, and Laura, you described it a minute ago, with the Amazon experience that, that they're getting ready to pilot, one of the biggest elements in what I do as a consumer myself, the reason I choose Amazon, the reason why I choose curbside pickup, the reason why I do those things is because it's easier for me than taking the time to go physically walk and go do it myself or sit somewhere else. I am more productive. I have more impact in my business. I have more impact with my family when I can choose to do things on my terms. And as a business, when I have a business that doesn't reflect those same values and sees my time and what I want to do, if they don't honor that and they force me to go through a process for the sake of the process, I start to seek out others that will do the process that works for me and makes it easy for me. And so both of their points, you know, talking about pickup and delivery and talking about these pieces, the dealerships that are going to win are going to be the ones that have the leadership fortitude that are going to embrace training, that are going to embrace new ways of looking at it. They're going to hold themselves accountable to those pieces and then also hold their people accountable too to embrace 
avenues that make it easier for the customer and easier to communicate those pieces to the customer. And speaking of making it easier for the customer, there's been a lot of talk recently about OE selling direct to consumer. But Owen Moon says that there are two facets of a dealership's operation that if they excel at, will ensure that the dealership remains an essential part of the equation. I, I, mean, I think dealers are make or break themselves on this. If they OEMs are really serious about it, the easy way to eliminate the dealer is because the dealer doesn't good, do a good job with finance and fixed operations. So own those pieces and really control that. And I think that it, it'll sort of take care of itself because the OEM is not going to be able to take the dealer out of it if those other pieces are in play. If we still lose... 70 cents out of every dollar that comes in the fixed operations department and that gets worse we, we lose 80 cents of that dollar there's no reason for the dealer so i, I think that dealers are definitely not going to let that happen but that's kind of a you know high level i mean if we can control our finance we can control our fixed operations i think that there will always be a distribution model for the dealerships that's my opinion anyways speaking personally amazon gave me back three or four hours a week that i'm not running out to go grab things that i need right so I appreciate the business model from that perspective. But if you consider Amazon who owns Zappos, so you can order shoes through Zappos and they have free shipping both ways. Well, the reason they did free shipping both ways on Zappos, in my opinion, I haven't read all the books on it, is that when you try on shoes, they don't fit sometimes. And so you have to, so they're trying to overcome the inconvenience of trying on those shoes. I think dealerships are much the same way, which is it's, it's the dealership's business to lose because one way or another, they're going to have to get their car fixed. And I think that the, that the OEMs are not going to be anxious about servicing cars because in order to do that, they're going to have to invest all the capital for the real estate and the garages and the lifts and the tools and the equipment and the people in order to go in direct competition with the dealers, assuming the state laws would allow them to do that. I don't think any of them are that interested in going to that level. I think they'll manipulate and use the dealer network as best as they are able and try to skirt around the laws the best that they are able, you know, in order to be profitable. I think the OEMs with subscription-based models are going to look to those kinds of things for additional profitability going forward. I think the first company to roll something like that out was BMW when they had a subscription for a heated seat. Uh, and I don't think consumer sentiment went over very well on that, as I understand it. And I may be wrong. There may be a, it may have been another subscription model that may have started before that. But I think the OEMs are, are scrapping for, for every penny and the dealers are as well. But I just don't see them going in competition with the dealers anytime soon. Too expensive. The biggest piece in the takeaway. So I have, I have a couple friends uh, who own Teslas and they, they were completely excited about the hype of, of what Tesla was, the brand all of those elements. And then when it came down to servicing it, it has been an absolute disconnected, you know, just gargantuanly horrible experience. Even though they have the ability to schedule a service appointment on, the, on an app, they have the ability to do these things. There is a complete disconnect between how that ultimately gets executed in repairing the vehicle. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about and what I've been having a lot of conversations with dealers on lately has been the benefits of a service department or a service BDC, being able to really take a big look at the entire customer picture and really valuing their time as they're preparing to book a service appointment, mobile service, whatever avenue is easiest for that customer. It's so much more impactful if I, as a consumer, if I'm calling and I, I have my oil change light on, you know, my, I drive a Honda Odyssey and I might have my B1 service light illuminated. It's so much more impactful for me when I have an individual that takes the time to look up my information, realizes my vehicle also has an open safety recall at the same time, communicates that to me, asks all these additional questions. And now I have a service appointment that encapsulates everything that I need to get done on that vehicle and communicates the expectations in an appropriate fashion. That's the biggest disconnect that I see 
between what happens from, you know, a direct to consumer kind of approach and the dealership franchise. Dealerships do an incredible job at a lot of locations with being thoughtful and mindful of that communication and stores that really do have an incredible service or incredible BDC process to catch those things and be aware of them and communicate them effectively to the customer. The customer wins and the dealership wins. Right now, the direct to consumer, they're not catching those pieces in between. You know, it's very, very like you pick the service, this is what you get. And we're not even going to tell you about the ones that you may or may not need because you didn't ask. All of that burden on the customer, it becomes really difficult for the customer to to service their vehicle. So for me, I think dealerships that are going to embrace this, the dealerships, they're going to have a place at the table as long as they can continue to deliver exceptional experiences and make it easy. Tom Klein talks about increasing regulatory enforcement against dealerships in 2024. We talk day's wait, and the panel gives their final thoughts on the year ahead after a word from our sponsor. Perception is not always reality. And, you know, there's this perception that the dealerships are more expensive for everything. And IntelliCheck kind of confirms that, that that's not the case. IntelliCheck helps dealerships become aware of where their prices stand in regard to their competitors. And IntelliCheck does a good job of giving us that pricing data to confirm that we're in the market. And this allows dealerships to make their customers aware of their competitive pricing. I placed two placards in the business center so they could see that while they're over there working on computers. I also placed it in our coffee area. We have a glass wall there. So when they walk in, as they're putting their creamer and sugar in their coffee, they're going to look up and see the pricing for our pricing as well as uh, our competitors. Introducing IntelliShare. IntelliShare contains all of IntelliCheck's promotional tools that you can use to promote your favorable prices, including IntelliAds, the printable flyers that you can show off in easel displays, IntelliMedia for your digital media boards, and IntelliWidgets, so you can show off price comparisons on your website and even let your customers schedule from the widget. Just having access to that data that they're able to provide gives us a good plan of how we're going to proceed. Call 877-827-7273 or go to IntelliCheck.com to find out more about how the IntelliShare series can help you grow your business. So about a year ago, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, sent out a press release that said that they were, these are my words, not theirs, but they were increasing communication with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or the CFPB. And if you look at the last 180 days, I'd say there have been at least three enforcement actions a month against car dealers for deceptive practices. So a deceptive practice, Brandon, is anything where you are enticing the customer to buy something, and then when they ultimately buy it, it's different than what was advertised, essentially. That can be done through a TV commercial. It can be done through advertisements on your website. It could be done in the, in the F&I process during the when the customer is choosing any additional products they want to buy. Some dealers were including products that the customer didn't even know they were buying, and it wasn't disclosed on the buyer's order or the retail installment sales contract. So there are so many different ways to be deceptive. Um, I certainly can't detail them here, but dealerships are... Paul Blanco in California was fined $27 million. I mean, there are some nuclear verdicts that are coming out of the Federal Trade Commission uh, over the past number of years. That was actually a state action. Tate Automotive, the dealership was closed in Arizona. I mean, there are, all you have to do is kind of Google enforcement actions of car dealers, and you'll see that it's happening not only on the federal level, but the state attorneys general are also very active in this space. And the one piece of advice I can give to dealers 
to avoid all these is shop your own website, shop your own offers. If you think it's deceptive, it probably is, number one. And number two, take care of your customer problems and take care of your employee problems because that's where 90%, I'd say, of the enforcement actions start is with upset customers or upset employees. They're the ones who feel taken advantage of, and then they go to the federal regulators, the regulators come in, and then you're off to the races. According to the panel, one of the biggest challenges that dealerships must address in 2024 is the issue of day's weight. And the long delays aren't necessarily caused by a parts or labor shortage. In this case, you almost have to silo it to, you know, to some of the discussions Sarah's had, you know, from a process standpoint, from a product standpoint, or from a, from different segments, if you're waiting, I, mean, I, I just had this happen to me. I, I my wife's vehicle has got to go in for, for oil change. And they're like, we can get you in on December 23rd. I'm like, for an oil change? Like, what, what the heck, you know? I think that's ridiculous. I think that we have to rethink the, the express lane and how we're driving those, you know, normal maintenance type scenarios through the drive. I, I think that with some of these late ownership services, some of these bigger repairs, things like that, to Sarah's point, I actually had this happen to myself where I was due for an oil change. I knew I had a recall. So I called to try to set them both up. And, and the, the service advisor was like, well, we can get you in for an oil change, but we got to get a part order for the recall. So why don't you get your oil change now? And then we'll call you back when the part's there and you can come back in. Well, I mean, I'm not a normal consumer, obviously. Being an owner of my own company, I'm not on vacation time. I don't have to worry about taking days off to get things done. But I still was like, imagine if I was just a regular consumer that I have certain amount of time off I can take and that type of thing. And this guy is literally does not care about my personal time to say, just come in and get this down done now and then come back later. So I actually flipped it on to exactly what Sarah just said. I actually smiled when she was talking because I was like, let's just wait for the part to come in and let me just take care of all of it at once because I'm still, you know, time is money sort of thing. And I'm not going to sit there and, you know, want to be making trips back to my dealership three or four times in a you know two week period, three week period. So I think that process is going to be everything in this. And I think that this is something that the dealerships challenge, you know, are dealing with every day. But how do you make sure that you're not 20 days out from an oil change? And then ultimately, but how do you make sure that you're, you know, not also making the customer come back three, four times for things that are a little bit out of their control, right? And so I don't have the answer. If I did, I'd, I'd be in, I'd be doing what Sarah's doing. <laughs> so obviously, we can market it and we can say, hey, we're your, you know, we're gonna take care of you as a as, as a dealership. We're gonna make sure that you're, you know, that you have the best experience and that type of thing. But marketing a lot of times is just you know, hype, so to speak, right? It's it's what happens after the fact. And if, if you can't back it up, you shouldn't be marketing it. And so I think something's got to change there. I think that we can, and then you, th- you throw this EV thing in as well. And all of a sudden there's a whole nother part of the business that's never really been, you know, sort of ironed out. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of challenges there, which which is why we we have kind of the problems we're having there right now. But if we're not addressing it and we're not trying to fix it, you know, all we're doing is just continuing down a bad path. And so I really look up to people like Sarah and, and people like that that are sitting there every day in the trenches trying to make it better for the consumer ultimately through educating and, and training the dealership side. It is incredible what you're describing because that is one of the pain points that I hear all the time across the industry is, well, I I would love my BDC team to make more appointments. We need more business to come in. But you look at the, the processes and you look at the pieces that are happening and you have BDC agents and service advisors that are telling customers, yeah, I know you want to come in this weekend, but the earliest I can get you in is three weeks from now. Well, that is, that is not a model to grow your business. And so where does that come from? Ultimately, what it boils down to oftentimes is that there's a complete disconnect between examining what is really happening in your shop and what's available in the scheduler. And oftentimes you don't have a company or you don't have, you don't have service directors or you don't have somebody else that's looking at all of those pieces collectively. And so what happens Look, I mean, things get crazy in a dealership. Sometimes a service director is like, you know what? Shut down the appointments for today. We can't book any more appointments. I'm going to turn off Express. I'm going to turn off this because it's crazy right now. Well, 
I was talking to a dealership uh, just a couple weeks ago. And what was amazing is when I went into the store, there was no cars in the lane and most of the bays were empty and they're going, there's no availability for today in the scheduler. What's happening? Like there's a disconnect between the two. So you have a department that is saying to the customer, we're busy. We're going to have to schedule you a few days from now. And then the reality of what the technicians are experiencing, it's very fragmented. So what I found looking under the hood in there was that there were disconnects between how op codes were being utilized. There was disconnects with scheduler efficiencies that were tying into the technician proficiencies and their efficiencies. And so being able to pull all of that data together, look at it and go, okay, staffing is a challenge. But how do we be more efficient with the people you have, the bays that you have, and tie all of that into how a customer can schedule those appointments? We freed up just so much more bandwidth for the BDC to go and book more appointments for people same day just by making little teeny changes in some of those systems that they're already using day in and day out. So, so to Owen's point, you know, training is super important. But it's also looking at the whole big picture together because so many different technology companies also silo their individual components of how it all pieces together in the customer experience. And you can't look at all of it in isolation. I did this. So from a personal consumer standpoint, this kind of falls right into what you're asking. I recently went in for just an oil change to the dealership. And I went in in the morning because I thought I could get in and out in an hour. I had an appointment while my car was in for the oil change, they realized that I was probably due for my 60,000 mile service and that my brakes were about 95% bad. So now what happened, I went in for an hour oil change. They said, well, we're going to have to keep it almost all day. And by the way, we don't have the time today for the 60,000 service to Owen's point. And you can take our shuttle home because you weren't expecting your car to be here all day. When I went to the shuttle, it was going to be two hours for me to get home because they had so many people to drop off at once. So I think this just fully illustrates it's not necessarily even the labor. If someone had just taken the time to look at my vehicle needs before I came in for that oil change and had scheduled into their day, oh, she's going to need a 60,000 mile service. Let's talk to her on the phone and see if she is going to say yes to that. And maybe she needs a way home that isn't going to take two hours. So I, with this example, I think it just clearly states it's not even necessarily about parts. Oh, and then I was going to have to come back in for the brakes because they didn't have the parts. So it was kind of, it's not only the labor available, it's no one taking the time to just really look at what these vehicles need when they come into the service drive and kind of planning for that ahead of time. That is a process and training element. That is not a parts shortage. Now, Lori, I I love that story because I I think to Brandon's point, that's exactly what was happening in these different rooftops that I've been in recently where they're talking about, well, we're looking and we're behind. We're, We're behind from last year and we need to get more service business. We need to get more vehicles. And you look at the resources and you're like, okay, so yeah, you're a little light on staff. Maybe you've lost a few technicians. Okay. But then you break it down even further and it's like, it's a timing thing. It's a complete disconnect between not necessarily the part availability piece, but miscommunication along the way. So if it's all the way back at the beginning with scheduling, well, first off, when that person is calling in, most people are just going to state the obvious of what's going on with their vehicle. If I see a B1 light on in my car When I call to make that appointment, I'm going to probably say something to the effect of, well, you know, if they ask me the question, why are you calling today? Okay, I need to get my B1 service done. If I take that completely at face value without looking at everything else that I have available to me about that customer, chances are if Lori's been to that business before, if her breaks are 95% done, she probably had a multi-point inspection somewhere along the line back that was yellow. For breaks. Maybe they weren't due yet, but they were upcoming. Well, somebody during that scheduling process, it's really easy to be able to pull up a history and see what was recommended previously, what was yellow, what was red. Are there declined services that didn't get done? Based on the mileage, if I call in and say, hey, I just need an oil change because I'm going on a road trip. Well, if if I tell the rep that my mileage is 59,835, 
well, hey, wait a minute, that's a 60,000 mile service. I should probably at least brief Sarah on that, that conversation. Hey, you know, you're really close to your 60,000 mile service visit. You know, this entails more. It entails your cabin and your engine air filters and these pieces. Is that what you would like to have done at this mileage? Or are you just looking to get the oil change? And, and that solves so many different logistical problems in that experience. But what's happening is, look, we have a lot of new service advisors. We had a lot of turnover and a lot of things happen post COVID. There's a lot of new faces, new employees. The advisors may not know and may not have been educated to back up the process all the way to before they ever set foot in the drive. A lot of what the lens of the advisor gets trained on is they're here, they're captive in front of you. Now go over what the technician found on the MPI. They're not connecting it all the way back to like what Lori said. She called to make an appointment. There were all these other components that just created a distressed experience. And what happens is reactively, oftentimes, oh my gosh, we got so many cars backed up. We need to shut down the scheduler. Let's not book an app- any more oil exchange appointments today because we got to get through all of it. So it's looking at the training all the way back at the very symptom. It's, it's treating it no differently than like you would at a doctor's office. You're looking at your blood pressure. You're looking at your heart rate. You have to look at all of these pieces together to really determine the next steps in that outcome. And I think to, to add to what Sarah just said, so the service advisors, in my opinion, are the most under the gun employees that you have. The phone starts ringing at 7 a.m. and it doesn't stop until they get in their car. And so starting with very simple things like what can you do as a dealership to take some of the phone traffic off those service advisors in order that they have time to do what Sarah says, right? They're so busy usually being reactionary that they don't have time to be proactive. And I saw one dealership group, I learned about one dealership group who in order to to help the customer and take some of the pressure off the service advisor, they established a a smart sheet or a Monday board where every time someone touched the car, they updated what was going on with that customer's car. And anybody who answered the phone at the dealership, when somebody calls up and says, hey, I'm trying to find out what's happening with my car, and the phone operator can pull up and say, oh, I see right here, the technician just took it back and is working on it, or the technician's just finishing up. And it takes the technician 30 seconds to put you know, 15 minutes left or w- whatever it is to update that spreadsheet so that anybody who answers the phone can tell the customer what's going on. So that helps the customer. It helps to take some of the phone traffic off the service advisor. And it allows them the time to think about exactly what Sarah is saying, which is, let me help so that Lori doesn't get caught waiting for two hours for the for the courtesy driver. Maybe they have a, a, a corporate account with Uber or Lyft, or maybe they use you know Hopcar or Traver Connect or whatever other services that'll help there. But that helps the whole system, helps the service advisors, it helps the customers, everybody's happy. Yeah, you know, I just the great conversation. I mean, I think everybody brings such a, a great focus on different areas of how to make that consumer experience better. If I was a dealership, you know, as I look at 2024, I would address a couple things. I would address your processes and I would address your people and, and just training and just making sure that you're doing all the little things correct and then really focus on, you know, from a, a I guess from a revenue standpoint. Um, one thing we didn't touch on that I, I, I talk a lot, a lot about is hitting those different profit centers, right? Tires, accessories, those are areas where as we continue to see compression on the sales side, as we continue to see keep people holding on to their vehicles longer, we're going to have a lot of opportunity to make money with uh, tires and accessories. And I, I don't know a lot of dealerships that do a very good job of it. In fact, most dealerships admittedly say that they're just not in the tires and accessories business. 
But when we lose those customers to those aftermarkets, uh, that's where, you know, there's just another wedge between us and the consumer and, and the next vehicle purchase. So uh, really look at everything. We kind of get back to the basics. And uh, I think you'll see that your 2024 will be a, a good year, um, even with some of the challenges that we've sort of outlined today. Yeah, Brandon, thank you for having all of us and for the superstars on the panel, Lori, Owen, and, and Sarah, uh, who I would encourage everyone to reach out to if you have any questions. Kind of the last thing I was thinking about is when you know dealers are superb entrepreneurs and you tell them they can't fix a problem and they will figure out a way to fix it. So when they're doing that, I would just encourage on the risk side of things. So we talked a little bit about compliance. But risk is, do you have insurance that would cover a problem if it comes up? So when you're thinking about some of these innovative solutions, whether it's a tech solution or whether it's something you come up with yourself, um, you should check with your insurance professional to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing is covered. Because the last thing you want to do is when you put your feet on the ground in the morning and you go to work, you've got you've got risk. That's what dealers do. That's what business owners have. They have risk. So you want to make sure that risk is covered. Uh, I'm certainly glad to answer any questions if anyone wants to call or reach out to me. But consider that as you're as you're inserting these solutions, uh, make sure your your rear end is covered. Yeah, I'm going to I'm just reiterating, I mean, everything everyone said. So there's some great products out there. And I, this is funny coming from me because I do PR for tech companies. But I would say it goes back to people process products. So it really is it really does start with your people, with the development and the training, then flows through to your process to make sure some of the things we're talking about from communication, that they're saying all the right things, they're ensuring customers are up to date on everything they need. And then you find the products to help fulfill those other areas. But it really people is really the beginning of all of it. This has been a really exciting conversation and there's so many great nuggets that I think everybody was speaking to today. And ultimately, you know, the driving home message for every dealer that's watching this today, you know, your fixed operations departments, there are so many pieces of the customer experience to choose from in today's environment. You as a dealership have to choose to embrace your own leadership training and your development and being aware of the pieces that you should be monitoring and paying close attention to, and also enabling your people to learn and deliver easier, better experiences through a variety of different mediums uh, that meet the customer where they are today. And so being able to tie all of those pieces with training, with communication, and then accountability all together, I think dealers are going to win in 2024 if they get started now. I'd like to thank Dealer Marketing Magazine and their amazing panel of Owen Moon, Laurie Halter, Tom Klein, and Sarah Vantine for an amazing discussion. You can find the Multipoint Inspection Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. It helps with the algorithm thingy. Executive producers for the Multipoint Inspection Podcast are Melissa Marlette and Joe Gibson. It is written, produced, and narrated by me, Brandon Barnett. This episode's featured music is Evergreens by Reveille. IntelliCheck. Know your competition.